It is NFC East week, finally. Kicking things off this week with the New York Giants. Uh, I'm sure there are a lot of masochistic Giants fans that just can't wait to hear all of the positive things we have to say about Big Blue. And I only say that half facetiously. Uh, There actually are a lot of positive things to talk about. Hell of a lot of negative things that we also are going to hit on related to the last regime that put them in the position they're in in the first place. But luckily, EJ, uh, I think you and I can agree that for once, things are starting to turn around, starting to look good. Adults are in control. Uh, There's a little glimmer of hope there. But before we get into all of that, uh, my friend, how are you doing? And what are you drinking tonight? I'm excellent because we don't have to talk about Gettleman in the present tense tonight. <laughs> and that that's just going to make me happy in a sort of core level. So I'm I'm doing good. I'm drinking seltzer because we're on pod something of pod something that we need to record um, somewhere in the stack. So trying to stay sentient for all these. And uh, no, it's going to be more fun to talk about the Giants because while they may not be in the best spot, they're in an improving spot. And that is a good thing. Uh, It should be a relief to all the fans of the Giants. And it's just more fun to talk about a somewhat hopeful situation. For once, Giants fans can can go into a season without having an existential crisis. So I'll give them that. It's been a while. Uh, But before we get into all the hopeful stuff, we do need to acknowledge with a little bit of a 2021 recap of how we got here where the roster had to be torn down so vigorously and rebuilt so quickly by the new regime because, my God, uh, (laughs) the previous regime did not leave a whole lot to work with. They did did go 4-13, which some would consider a disappointment. I think a lot of people would also consider that right in line with expectations, considering who was in charge. They did finish last in the division, uh, home record three and five, road record one and eight. They were terrible on the road, absolutely horrific on the road. Um, and I think that the uh, the last five games, technically the last six games where they lost six in a row, it's pretty much all you needed to see. I, I don't like to say that that players gave up on the coaching staff. But I do think that as soon as you call a a QB sneak on third and nine, it's a lot harder for me to suit up with any sort of earnesty if I was an NFL player. Because at that point, it'd be like, are you wasting my time? Are are you risking me getting hurt for this? You know, it'd be a lot harder for me to get amped for playing for my coach if he called that on third and nine. So uh, as soon as that happened, I think you and I both agreed like, yeah, he was he was on the way out and it, it took a little while to get to the decision, but eventually uh, they did move on from Joe Judge after that late season uh, <laughs> terribleness. To we'll put call it, it a slide. It and be, yeah. you know. Is it really a slide if you're already like subterranean? I. It, it's more like a baseball term because when you say slide, it's like, oh, well, you know, there's a slide, but then they could go back up again. In football, no, it's just a slide. To, <laughs> these are the remaining games on the slate, and then we're going to fire everybody. So uh, I think slide is uh, benevolent. Um, if if anything, I think these moves in combination came a year too late. I was not thrilled with what I saw out of the Joe Judge regime. There were some glimmers of hope in the last half of the season before the one we're talking about. In the 2020 season, they played the Seahawks real tough on the road, and I thought, well, maybe, maybe they're buying in. Maybe it's maybe it's starting to come around. No, mm-mm. no, I was, I was more right about the first half. I should have just stuck with it. And it felt to me a little bit like the Bears situation where it was like, no, I've seen enough, and, you know, about a year and a half before Nagy and Pace left town, I was saying, nope, it's time to move on. And I, I felt similarly about the Giants. So they got it right in the end. Um, it took a while, and it was really hard to suffer through for all the fans. I apologize, not that I had any hand in it, but I'm sorry you had to watch that. Uh, it was no fun to watch that in your football team. But the good news is who they replaced them with should be much more fun to watch. Oh, this is the most excited I've been for a Giants power structure in as long as I can remember, to be perfectly honest. It's been Uh, a bit. 
I mean, they basically just were like, hey, everything that's working for the Bills, let's just go poach that. And I, I, I think that that's probably the model program that you want to build around this year. Is whatever Buffalo's doing, let's match that. Uh, Joe Shane, Brian Dable, uh, Mike Kafka, which not from Buffalo, it's from the Chiefs. But still, they were basically just looking around the league of like the most successful offenses, the most successful environments that have developed young quarterbacks because they still believe in Daniel Jones. And they were poaching whatever resources from those programs they could get. So Joe Shane, again, year one at GM. Brian Dable, year one at head coach. Mike Kafka uh, at offensive coordinator. He was formerly the Chiefs uh, QB coach and pass game coordinator there. Also, fun fact, Mike Kafka um, was known as the guy in Kansas City that would come up with all the wacky red zone plays. Like he's the idea guy over there. Um, you know, all the, you know, the, the weird shovel pass shenanigans to Travis Kelsey and, and the motions and the direct snaps. And every time they get inside the five yard line, the Chiefs do just weird shit. And it usually works. Like they usually get touchdowns out of it. Yeah, that was all Mike Kafka. He would just every week come up with something funky to install just to throw people off. And they, they were really hard to prepare for the red zone just because of that, because you always knew something was coming. Uh, and it usually worked. So I'm really excited to see what he can do for this Giants team, not just as a play caller, um, but also in terms of a, an architect of a potentially very, very, very fun, wacky red zone offense. Uh, at defensive coordinator, you got Wink Martindale, amicably, amicably I should say, uh, parted with the Ravens. Um, they kind of wanted to go into a little bit of a different direction, bringing in Coach Mack from Michigan who had a lot of familiarity with the Ravens anyway. uh, But so Wink was a free agent. Giants brought him in because he is a proven defensive uh, architect. His philosophy is very, you know, (laughs) got to risk it for the biscuit. Very blitz heavy, very man coverage heavy. And I think that's a big reason why the Ravens, you know, kind of wanted to get a little bit away from that philosophy. But if you're an aggressive team, and you really want to lean into that, like Wink is the guy you want running that style of defense because he is just relentless in terms of not just the amount of pressure he's going to call, but the types of pressures he's going to call. He makes it his life goal to just make quarterbacks uncomfortable. And if he loses in the process because you punish zero, so be it. But he's going to hurt your quarterback along the way. So that was the kind of approach the Giants want to go with, just pressure, pressure, pressure and live with the consequences on the back end. Uh, And then Thomas McGoy, he actually survived the transition between regimes because as we've, uh, as we've talked about multiple times on this show, if you have a decent to good special teams coordinator, you never let them go. They are the one position that we see survive regime changes over and over again, because believe it or not, it's pretty hard to find a good special teams coach. And they know the whole roster. They get to work with offense and defense. So if you're a new coach coming in with inheriting a bunch of players on the roster who you're going to keep, a special teams coach can be, if you can get along with that coach as a new and incoming coach, it's a great key to learning the existing roster. It's, it's almost like a set of cliff notes because special teams coaches know the whole team. So um, when Dable got hired and was assembling this staff, we kept pinging each other back and forth like, oh. <laughs> oh, well, all right. Like, I, I like the Dable hire period, but, you know, now he's got Kafka. Now he's got Martin Daly. Like, okay. All right. Like, I feel a lot better about this, not a little bit better about it. Um, Joe Shane proved his medal in the draft this year. We'll talk about that. Um, again, it reminds me very much of the first year when Bean came into Buffalo. And there was a lot of cleaning house to do. And there was a lot of moves where people were like, what's he doing? It's like, this is, we're setting the foundation. We're building the backbone. It's not all going to happen in a year. We weren't in that place as a team. The Giants are in a similar place. Uh, The former regime, both coach and GM, didn't do a lot to draft and develop. Uh, They they sort of changed horses midstream or, or stayed on a horse too long that was long past due, whichever Whichever one you want, it didn't work out. And the roster shows that. And we're going to talk about that as we go into losses and everything else. But they didn't stop with the top-level coaches. They kept going. And we're going to go into notable coaches. And they've got some fun ones on the staff. I want to start off with, on the offensive side, Laura Young and Angela Baker. 
Mm -hmm. and I mentioned them. So Laura Young is a director of coach operations, and you might say, what the hell is that? In fact, you did say, what the hell is that? (laughs) Um, It's a title that gets shifted around in the NFL. Sometimes it's called chief of staff. Sometimes it's called chief of operations. Sometimes it's called coaching operations. Sometimes it's called coaching logistics. Um, They have different roles, but it is that sort of overseer role that does a lot of coordination between all the coaches on staff, uh, you know, upper level and lower level and uh, scouting staff sometime as well. So uh, it's a very important job. And Angela Baker is an offensive quality control assistant. Um, She is first recipient of a Giants coaching fellowship for minorities and women. Notably, they're the first two women to hold coaching positions with the Giants ever. So Mm -hmm. wanted to lead with that. We're seeing more and more of it around. Um, All for it in terms of bringing quality coaches. Again, both these coaches came from different places. Um, We've talked a lot about relationships and, and where they cut their teeth. They end up on the Giants staff. Really excited for that. Mike Groh is the wide receivers coach. The sort of uh, well traveled, he's well been experienced everywhere. I swear. Yeah. So wide receiver coach. He has had that role with Alabama, the Bears, the Rams, the Eagles, and the Colts. Um, so if you remember his name, it's either because of that or because he's the son of longtime coach Al Groh, who was the head mm-hmm. coach of Virginia and has had roles in the NFL as well. Uh, DeAndre Smith is the running back coach. Now, Coach Smith played in the CFL, but he's got 22 years of coaching experience uh, at 11 different universities. <laughs> if you look, if you look at his sort of coaching vita, it's ridiculous. He's been everywhere, coast to coast, north to south. Um, he is the definition in my book of a lifer. Uh, this is a guy that lives to coach football. And last name on the offensive side, Tony Sperano Jr., assistant offensive line coach for the Giants, son of former Dolphins head coach Tony Sperano. So connections there. On defense and special teams, both defensive coaches, Andre Patterson is the defensive line coach. He's a former co-defensive coordinator for the Vikings, and he's been coaching since 1982, which is before a lot of our listeners and viewers were born. Um, one fun fact from digging down his coaching roles, he was an assistant uh, at Renton High School, which is like 12 miles from me. It's right south uh-huh. of the uh, VMAC, which is where the Seahawks practice facility is. Um it was a long time ago. I was still in high school when he was a coach at Renton High School. Um, but Brian Cox is the other one. He's the assistant defensive line coach for these Giants. He is a former Bear, Jet, Patriot, and Saint. He first coached in 2006. Coming off a bit of a break, he left coaching, uh, got wooed back by this Giants staff. So, again, you put Wink at the top, and then you get Andre Patterson and Brian Cox coaching a defensive line. You're going to see some pressure, Giants fans, like no doubt about it. All three of those guys are in lockstep of bring it and hit the quarterback. So you're going to see plenty of that, but all kinds of fun. Also, if if the name Brian Cox sounds familiar, uh, it's because, yes, he was a Buffalo Bill last year, but I'm talking about Brian Cox Jr., Brian Cox's son. So even more Bills connections, just, just for fun. Uh, just for- yeah, this is a really really uh intriguing staff uh andre patterson one of the best defensive line coaches in the league i don't think you'll find many people to argue that brian cox is also a very good defensive line coach himself and uh i think looking at some of the defensive line talent that that the giants have which is relatively tantalizing especially with some of the recent draft picks they've made I'm really, really curious to see the kind of stuff they get up to on third down. Like, if there's one thing the Giants are going to do well, it's going to hit quarterbacks. And I think that all of their coaching hires uh, are going to be a big part of that. Just one thing, really quick. A big reason why we can afford to make 40 episodes in this team summer preview series and roll out a new show every day is because of our partners like Babbel. Babbel is a language learning app for people like me that really want to become functional speakers of German, for instance, for hopefully an upcoming trip to see an NFL game in Munich, but who also don't really have a whole lot of time to learn German. Or even not just German, but up to 14 different languages, really, including Spanish, French, and Italian, too. Babbel lessons have been created by over a hundred different linguistics experts and are scientifically proven to be effective. And perhaps most importantly of all, they do have speech recognition technology in order to help improve pronunciation and accent. 
Because at least for me, if I'm going to be running around Munich shouting Sprechense English at everybody I see just to get directions, I at least want to sound sort of like I know what I'm doing. Babbel also gives you access to podcasts, games, videos, stories, and even live classes. Plus, it comes with a 20-day money-back guarantee. So if you yourself are interested in learning a second or even third language, right now you can get a three-month subscription of Babbel at the link in the description below, and you will get an additional three months for free on top of that. That is six months of Babbel language lessons for the price of three, again, at the link in the description below. That is babbel.com promo code bootleg. Once again, babbel.com promo code bootleg. And with that, let's get back to the show. I do want to get into the depressing part of this episode, though. <laughs> the culling. The amount of, and I, I use the term losses loosely, the amount of turnover on this roster is utterly absurd. Like, this might be the largest chart of so-called losses of any team this year. Like, they had to do so much cutting and 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 just it really speaks to how screwed up of uh, screwed up of a position Dave Gettleman left this roster in that uh, I mean a lot of the players they were quote unquote losing weren't even like key pieces but they just they couldn't afford to keep their depth they couldn't afford to keep some of their actual good players because they had no money like James Bradbury you know, they didn't let go of him because they wanted to. They let go of him because they had to. They had to save money. You know, Lorenzo Carter, they probably would have liked to keep around, but again, they, they had no money. Uh, Jabril Peppers, quality player. He only signed for like a couple million to the Patriots, but they needed they needed to make cuts. Like Will Hernandez, he's been up and down, obviously, but I, I think that he still at least would, would be somebody you want to keep around as a depth piece, if not outright starter. Um you know, especially because Duke Mannyweather really, really believes in him, and I believe in whoever Duke believes in. You know, Logan Ryan, uh, another notable loss. Like, there's a lot of players that they would have liked to keep. They just had no money. So they were tearing this thing down to the studs. Um, you know, Kyle Rudolph is gone. Nate Solder is gone. Reggie Ragland is gone. Some of these are addition by subtraction, but still, like, depth is depth. So when you look at the roster, like, it, it, the top 22 is okay. Like, you can ride with that, but good lord they are thin because they just couldn't afford depth players at all like if they if they start taking injuries they're screwed like straight up screwed like they they really have to stay healthy or it's gonna be it's gonna be rough yeah and even with all the names you mentioned there's two-thirds more names on the list Mm -hmm. they just they had to slash this thing down. They wanted to slash some of it, but they had to slash other parts. Bradbury, the most notable example. Definitely a corner you would keep trying to keep a competitive defense, especially because he would fit pretty well in Martindale's defense. They had to sign their rookies. They didn't have any money. So all the people that have piped up and said, you know, in the past, oh, well, Dave Gettleman, he knows what he's doing. He builds from the trenches. He builds inside out. I challenge you to look at this roster and this teardown and what they're left with and say, oh, yeah, that was a super well-constructed roster. It really wasn't. They've He just didn't have a cohesive plan, and he didn't keep up with how the league was changing, and this is the result of that. This is what's happening. It's not just new guys taking over and going, I want my guys. This is them going, I need cash to sign any guys, and a lot of these guys I'm not going to use anyways, so I'm literally, it's like a page and a half in our agenda of losses. It's easily the longest one we've encountered so far, and if we encounter one that's longer, I'd be a bit shocked because I can't think of another team that needed this much work in the offseason. And, and I I honestly don't even want to do the, the retentions and the third-party additions in separate charts because it's it's small like we we might as well cover them together in terms of players that they were able to re-sign and players they brought in from other sources it's not a whole lot in terms of notable additions and retentions and even the ones that are notable the most expensive one is like six million for a guard you know sterling shepherd three million for retention blake martinez three million those are the only like quote unquote high dollar amounts that they spent on their own players and that's not even high that's pennies relatively speaking 
Uh, and then third party additions. I mean, Tyrod Taylor, five and a half million to be a, a stable veteran backup, which we love that signing, but mm-hmm. I couldn't afford anything more than that. Uh, but, you know, Justin Ellis for 1.2, Jihad Ward, rotational pass rusher, 1.2, Ricky Seals Jones, who I, I like a lot as like a hybrid tight end receiver type, but they only got him because he cost less than $2 million. Max Garcia is a, a swing center slash guard for them. He's definitely not going to start, at least not initially, but they could only afford Max Garcia because he's less than a million and a half. Uh, Matt Breida, again, an, an older running back with injury history. They're like, fine, cheap. Give me cheap. Like, they are moneyballing this thing. The only starter that they spent a semi-decent amount of money on was Mark Lewinsky to play right guard. Other than that, every piece they brought in was probably the cheapest one they could find in the bin. And that's just what they had to do. And they did a good job doing it. But you could tell, like, this was straight up early to mid 2000s Oakland A's type roster building cuz that they, <laughs> they had no other option. I don't want to go back to what you said about Mike Kafka and his creativity near the goal line and three players that they brought in. Yes, that were bargains and necessarily didn't play a ton of snaps for their previous teams. But you can start to see and Dable's creative as well. We talked in the Bills episode uh, about Dable's creativity on offense and how it changed weekly. So when you get Dable and Kafka in the same room and then you start seeing players like Ricky Seals-Jones, who's going to be an interesting matchup on the goal line. Matt Breida, who, again, coming over from the Bills, and even if his role is only teach everybody else Dable's offense, you know they're getting that for $1.1 million. And then Richie James. And me, people might say, Richie James, who's that? He's a guy that didn't play a lot with San Francisco. He is a smaller, you can call him gadget receiver, runner, returner. Um, One of those guys literally, you know, was hurt, played 0% of the snaps for San Francisco, but you can just see Mike Kafka going, I know what I'm going to do with him. (laughs) Like, I've got a couple plays up my sleeve. And again, he comes over for a million flat, right? Which if you're going to get any snaps out of him in any of, you know, the two phases offense or special teams is a great deal. And you might look at an addition like Richie James and say that eh, no impact there mm, with guys like Dable and Kafka running the show. I bet there's going to be some, and yeah, this is just going through the racks and trying to refill the roster. And, you know, somebody goes, okay, you need 30 guys. Here's 10 bucks. Like, tell me what you find. And <laughs> this is the list of what they found. Sterling Shepard, I like the retention, but again, $3 million in the current wide receiver market. I I tend to like Sterling Shepard as what I think he is, which is like a very solid number three. I realize they've been playing him more as a two, but, you know, I think, again, they have a role for him. Blake Martinez, eh, you know, I'm going to talk about some other players they brought in that might challenge him for that role. But again, $3 million, uh, a guy that, knows the defense and who Martindale I'm sure signed off on and said, Nope, I, I know what he can do. I've seen him play. Like I can use him. Right. (laughs) Don't pitch all my linebackers. Keep a couple. They're like, all right, we can get it for 3 million. Cool. Plug him in. So it wasn't the most exciting off season for giants fans in terms of like, Oh, we're going to do this. And we're going to bring in all these, you know, they maybe look South to Miami where they go in the winter and say, Oh, they got Tyree kill. What did we get? <laughs> oh, you got Richie James. Okay. Um, this isn't the year. for If exciting. you this... squint real hard, it's almost the same thing. <laughs> yeah. We got some beachfront slash bridge front property for you too. Um, <laughs> No, this wasn't the year for that. They needed to do this. And this is no fun. But this is what you have to do when there's been mismanagement before you if you're going to have progress in the future. Again, Brandon Bean had to do this when he got to Buffalo. Ryan Poles just did it, cleaning up all of Ryan Pace's messes in Chicago. And Joe Shane's no different. He came in and said, nope, we're not keeping hardly any of that. <laughs> we need to go in a different direction. And this is what a different direction looks like on paper. To put it into context, the Giants have the fifth least cap space as it stands right now in the NFL at about $6 million, which is chump change. But because of all the clearances they did, they have the fourth most projected next offseason. So Giants fans, we're going to be we're going to be talking about a lot of additions going into 2023 because as of right now, they got $55 million 
available before we even get to extensions and restructures and cuts. And I would not be surprised if they do further slashing and they get it to like 80. And at that point, if you got 80 million, now you're, you're, you're going big game hunting in free agency. So I think the plan is put together a solid season with what you got, make it, make it look to free agents and agents alike that you know what you're doing here and then just use all that money to get a couple stars and and figure out the rest but that's the plan you're gonna have to endure some bumps and bruises along the way but it, it's the only plan they got I, I will say this though looking at their draft that's where you started to see a lot of the depth come back that's where because they had a massive class huge class compared to a lot of other teams that was really where I started to see them kind of fill in some of the holes that that were created from this slash and burn operation. And I thought they did a, a pretty good job of at least trying to mitigate some of the bleeding here. Yeah, a lot of picks, and they needed them. They need them all, and we just talked about all the reasons why. Up top, they went fairly blue chip heavy. Uh, we'll talk about the exception in round two, but in terms of number of overall picks... Two ones, a two, two threes, two fours, three fives, and a six. So just in in volume, <laughs> they needed volume. They took them all. Uh, they start off right up top, round one, pick five. There was a lot of question about which way they would go. Kayvon Thibodeau is the defensive end from Oregon. He's still on the board, and they say, uh, yep, we want to <laughs> do that. Um, I'm super excited about Thibodeau under Wink Martindale because I'm like oh yeah you just got a you got a tool you got a weapon you can use him in so many ways great pick there second round one pick only two picks later pick seven Evan Neal the offensive tackle from Alabama who we both agreed is eh, one of the safest players in this draft a shoe in to start at one of their tackle positions and hopefully a long-term starter for them Round two, this is the one where a bunch of Giants fans crowed about it and said, eh, it seems really early. So pick 43, they get Wandale Robinson, the wide receiver from Kentucky. On the smaller side, um, really difficult to bring down, but I think a very purposeful pick from a new offensive staff that was looking for a particular set of skills to fill a role that they didn't think was filled on the current roster, and they believe he's the guy to fill it. Now, lots of people disagreed with that. <laughs> um, I'm going to give him a chance uh, because, again, I think they saw something like a lot of people said, well, you just picked a player like that last year and not necessarily the same. And they can probably be used in tandem to bring some electricity to your offense. So I'm going to say just give him a little grace. I, I think that as soon as that pick happened, and we said it during the draft live stream, I was like, oh, he's their new Isaiah McKenzie. Because that's, that's what the staff wanted, was a slot receiver that they can put in motion to back a corner off, you know, run these crossing routes mm -hmm. against single high safety looks, because that's what they did in Buffalo, was they would do everything they could <laughs> to get you into cover one and cover three, and then they were going to hit you with crossing routes from the slot. And that's what Isaiah McKenzie did over and over and over and over again. They didn't really have anybody else on the roster that was that pure, just burn and churn, you know, smaller type guy. Like, sure, Kadarius Tony could do it, but, you know, that's not necessarily what I want Kadarius Tony's main role to be. I want Kadarius Tony, you know, running the quick hitters and being the separator against, you know, press man coverage and being the yak guy. Like, I want Wandale Robinson to be my dude that I'm hitting you know, high cross is 30 yards down the field from the slot. Like, that's what I want him to do. And they didn't have anybody else that, that was really that specific role. So as soon as he got picked, especially considering his measurables are just literally Isaiah McKenzie 2.0, it immediately made sense to me. And even if he only catches 25, 30 balls this year, his average per catch is going to be sizable. That, that uh, I can almost guarantee. Yeah, and even if his average depth of target is in the single digits, <laughs> his yak yards are going to be high. That's his game. That's what he had on full display at Kentucky, and you're going to see a bunch of that in this offense. 
The next pick in round three, pick 67, one of my biggest celebrations of this draft, and that's <laughs> Joshua Azudu, the offensive lineman from North Carolina. Azudu was a guy that I got turned on to early by Brandon Thorne, and when I went back and was doing my sort of final quarterback calibrations, and I was looking at Sam Howell, uh, who we're going to talk about this week as well, Azudu, I... I'd already seen most of the Howell games. It was a second watch for them, so I could kind of turn an extra eye, and my eye went to Josh Azudu over and over and over again. And I was like, man, he got so good by the end of the year at North Carolina. He was making massive holes in the run game. Super athletic guy, great size. Really excited for what he's going to bring to their offensive line. The second, third round pick from them, 81, Cordell Flott, the cornerback from louisiana state university uh dbu to many uh we'll see if he lives up to that he certainly has a path uh, a to lot playing of, time a lot of people in columbus right now that are grabbing a brick just saying i i'm saying many people <laughs> say it i'm not saying it's my dbu um you know there's a case for washington too but we're that's a whole debate for another time uh round four pick 112 daniel bellinger the tight end from san diego state good two-way tight end that you said when we were talking about this pre-show that they are going to work really hard to turn into Dawson Knox 2.0, and I couldn't agree more. That's the role they have in mind for him. Whether or not he ascends as quickly as Dawson Knox did within a couple seasons, we'll see. Can he? He could. He has similar skills. Uh, Second, fourth round pick, 114, Dane Belton, the safety from Iowa. Dane Belton is a hammer. Uh, is a really good athlete. Not surprising. Tell me if you've heard this one before about Iowa safeties, right? <laughs> it's real hard, real good athlete. Um, I see him more as depth piece, third safety, special teams guy. We'll see what his role is. Um, not a guy you're going to plug into a starting roster, in my opinion, right away and say, go cover that guy. Um, at least not if you want to be successful. Round five, pick 146, Micah McFadden, the linebacker from Indiana athletic freak RAS in the mid nines just over six feet tall tested at just over 240 pounds ridiculously quick at that size so he is going to make an immediate mark on special teams but I imagine they're going to plug him in right behind Blake Martinez and say all right get disciplined on the run reads just like this guy and then when it goes outside unleash that athleticism you got guy go get him uh that's I can see that happening. There are a lot of Indiana faithful who said, check out Micah McFadden. This guy is a ridiculous athlete on par with We Indiana even talked to people Wisconsin. that played against him. And they're, uh, <laughs> at Shrine Bowl, we talked to people who played against him. And it, we literally asked, who's the best player you played against? And they said, oh, that Indiana linebacker. Yeah. He's a menace. Chigakonkwo said, I knew Micah McFadden was good going in. I mean, I, I like I knew he was a player. I didn't know he was that good. Yeah. And I, I think there's a lot there. There's some untapped potential. So a, a great pick that late. Um, second fifth round pick of their three fifth round picks, DJ Davidson, defensive tackle from Arizona State. A lot of people might not be familiar. Um, great tackle for loss stats uh, in college. Um, one of the highest in all of college football. So a penetrator, a guy that can, you know, wreck people. The ASU defense overall was not super highly regarded. A couple other players on there, mostly in the secondary, but DJ Davidson was making plays up front for them even when they were getting blown out. The last round five pick, 173, Marcus McKethan, uh, offensive guard from North Carolina, the other guard from North Carolina. So the guy that played on the other side. And then round six, a guy that I did not think was still going to be there, and that's Darian Beavers, the linebacker from Cincinnati. I had him pegged to go to any Belichick system, which is a little <laughs> strange considering the Patriots are moving away from what you call refrigerators at linebacker. Darian Beavers uh, has that size profile. Big guy was the bigger of the two Cincinnati linebackers, but can move a good bit too. Um, and I – thought that was a tremendous value i do not know why he ended up in the sixth round i would have said any time from about mid fourth you could have picked darian beavers and made me thoroughly happy as a choice and a value um but he was still there again round six pick 182 that rounds out their class and ed is a really strong class they needed a strong class i can see fit and roll for almost all those players who are the standouts for you 
I mean, I I do. I'm, I'm okay with the Thibodeau pick. Um, I was. I, I don't want to say I was low on Thibodeau. I just wasn't maybe as high as as some other people were that you know had him as like you know number one overall, number two overall. I, I was more you know maybe ten to twelve picks lower than that, but. If we're talking about the difference between the fifth pick and the thirteenth pick, like, does it really matter that much? Like, if if you like the guy and he's uh, an extremely important position, like Edge, just take him, figure it out later. So again, it wasn't like egregious to me. I just happened to have a little bit higher of a grade. Uh, well, this is gonna sound fucking crazy because he won the second round. I have a higher grade on Ebikiti than I did on Thibodeau. Does it matter that much? Not really, because he's still a good player. I still had a first-round grade on him, you know, just a little bit earlier than maybe I I thought he would go. Uh, Evan Neal at pick seven, loved it. Absolute freak of nature, athlete. It's going to be rock solid for them, um, as long as durability holds up, and especially considering, you know, what Andrew Thomas is now compared to what Andrew Thomas was as a rookie. <laughs> this This could, on paper, be a very, very very good tackle duo, which is exactly what Daniel Jones needs to be successful because Daniel Jones pocket presence is still not ideal (laughs) to be diplomatic about it. Um, I do think that he needs all the help that he can get in terms of protection. And at least on paper, the line that is now in front of him finally at long last, like four years into his career is at the point where I think that he's actually going to get some three second bursts here and there where he can actually just sit in the pocket and read. You know, because when Daniel Jones is under pressure, Daniel Jones makes mistakes. So limiting pressure was of utmost importance, and I think they did that. So I think they did very, very well in round one. Round two, again, I this is I have to separate my grade of a player in a vacuum versus the role they will play. I have a lower grade on Wandell Robinson, the prospect, than the 43rd pick in the draft. But I also recognize the role that he's going to play and how productive and valuable he can be in that role so within the context of the Giants in this offense it's fine but we have to separate grade in a vacuum versus grade for a team two very different things I know Giants fans were panicking a little bit especially considering some of the other receivers that were on the board but you just you have to consider the role he's going to play and how few guys in this class in their view could play that role he is one of them uh, Azudu, like you said, uh, for an athletic depth piece along the offensive line that can run block the shit out of people. I'm totally cool with that. Um, I am curious if he's going to be tackle or guard because right now they have him listed at tackle. So maybe they're going to try him out there and then put him inside later. Or maybe he's he's like a swing tackle slash guard, just like Max Garcia is a, sling, a swing center slash guard. Like if they're only going to dress seven guys you know maybe Azudu's the the sixth and and Garcia's the seventh um because a lot of teams only dress seven offensive linemen you know eight at most so I, I could see him as a versatile piece maybe being used like that uh Flot I think for a secondary as thin as they are right now like they are banking on Aaron Robinson being the guy uh at the left man. corner you know they, they took him in the third round last year and, and he didn't play that many snaps but he's very talented if he steps up like they hope that he's going to step up in the absence of Bradbury, then Flot won't have to play that much. That's the goal. But this is a very thin secondary. Injuries happen. I'm not necessarily sure that Flot could play right now, day one, and be okay. I would rather him sit for a little bit, but I do acknowledge that he is very talented. But message of the day, this team is thin. They better hope they stay healthy. Um, Bellinger, like you said, that's the new Dawson Knox for them. They hope. This team, (laughs) their depth chart at tight end. (sighs) There's no other way to say it. It's ass. It's just ass. Like, Daniel Bellinger, as a fourth-round rookie, will probably be the starter, which is almost unheard of. Like, that's how thin they are at tight end. Like, it's either him or it's Ricky Seals-Jones. It's probably not Aikens. It's probably not, you know, Miarek. Like it's, ugh, yeah, God. it's, 
it they're very lucky that this tight end class had some depth in it because they had to wait it, it it's not that tight end is not important enough to what they're doing that they could have spent a higher pick on it so they had to wait until the fourth or fifth and the fact that this was a deep enough tight end class that there was still a player there that we feel reasonable about you know he probably would have been a te2 or te3 on most teams that he landed on but like they still got a guy with some quality potential in the fourth round they're just lucky if they'd waited last year that long they would have got nothing year before uh uh-uh either so uh you know nice job by joe shane playing the board but i would not trade this tight end room for any other tight end room like i this would i'd be like nope you keep it (laughs) that's fine who starts bellinger or Adam Shaheen on this roster? On this roster, probably Shaheen based on experience. And I, you know, that my tells you a lot. Adam Shaheen. Yes. That tells you a lot. Just say it. Yeah. No, and you're not wrong. And it doesn't get a whole lot better behind it. Again, this is a, you can't remake every position that needed remaking on the Giants in one year. And tight end is the one that got one of the shorter straws. They got one good player. Ricky Seals Jones can do some. I would say sort of role specific or gadget specific things for them. He will get used. He will get downs. But other than that, um, it's an area they'll be putting more emphasis into next year. The good news is that next year's tight end class. I don't know if you've looked at it. I have. Son of a bitch. (laughs) We're talking about Kyle Pitts being like, oh, the unicorn. There's like maybe three Kyle Pitts in that class. I'm, uh, I'm not say kidding. One and a, I would say one and a half based on what I've seen. It's still, if, you know, Kyle Pitts was a quote unquote generational talent. Generation is 20 years. Uh, we waited two years and we got another two guys that are like legit comparable to him. As and two of per- them are on the same team out of the top three. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty good. <laughs> like that's, that's okay. So again, Joe Shane could be looking at that and say, you know, we'll, we'll ride for a year with, with, limited resources at tight end and then next year with what will probably be a fairly high pick we'll go hunting for a for a number one yeah so it's just it's it's a very very good job that they did you know kind of at least attempting to start to restock the cupboard here they got value they got key players that are going to help daniel jones succeed as much as he possibly can which was the prime imperative you know or prime directive whatever the phrase is um I think that they did as, as good as they possibly could. And also, I think their special teams unit is going to be disgusting with some of the guys they got on day three. So, overall, golf claps all around. Uh, UDFAs <laughs> also got some some pretty good values. Uh, they are clearly one of the organizations that I think is in love with the UDFA process because they, they, they nabbed some dudes that I thought could have been drafted in like middle of the sixth round and it would not have phased me at all several and that's the mark of a really good udfa class so you know joe shane picked up from his mentor brandon bean and said no we're going to take some chances we need to take some chances to refill this roster um the headliner for me is jay sean corbin the running back from florida state we got a chance to see him uh talented guy that will have a depth role on an nfl roster whether it's with the giants or somebody else um big guy a lot of athletic talent um and that translates really well to the way that he runs uh austin allen the tight end out of nebraska uh you don't need a number to figure out which one austin allen is on the field <laughs> he's six nine that is not a typo folks yes six nine so um not as good as the other allen at tight end uh in this draft who's chase allen but uh again you want a red zone target how about a six nine guy uh with really long arms that you can just run down the middle of the field and, and toss the ball up to and look they can do that he'll probably see some time uh also gets in the way pretty well as a blocker a lot of experience with that at nebraska Josh Rivas, uh, internal offensive line guard at Kansas State. Um, Again, a guy that's going to be playing for backup depth. And if you look at this roster, yes, they're thin. Yes, they need it. (laughs) Uh, He has a chance to win at least a practice squad spot and come up, possibly be a spot starter in a couple of years. Christopher Hinton, I want to talk about. uh, Defensive tackle from Michigan. This is a guy that probably five months ago, people were like, oh, yeah, solid, like, 
fourth, fifth, sixth round. Like, mm-hmm. He's getting drafted. 100% he's getting drafted. Something happened. He's available. The Giants go, yo, we could use a depth piece on the defensive line that played at a major program and has some, you know, very clearly identified strengths. So Chris Hinton ends up in the Giants camp. And then Yusuf Corker, big safety out of Kentucky, who runs and hits. Um, doesn't always run the right direction. There's some <laughs> big plays. I was wondering if you were going to say it first or and me. <laughs> I, got, I got really excited about Yusuf Corker for about five minutes when I was watching him. First, you know, first couple plays in the game I was watching, and I was like, damn. That guy's got good size, and he can move. And, ooh, when he gets there, he delivers, right? SEC player, fair number of starts. I was like, this this is a guy. And as the rest of the two-thirds of the game unfolded, I was like, oh, and he missed. And, oh, he got held up on a block. And, oh, he overran the gap. And, oh, and I was like, oh, okay, okay, I get it. This is why he isn't higher up on, on safety boards. Now, that being said, great special teams prospect. Good size, good speed, hits like crazy. Um, again, take a shot on a guy like that as a udfa if he comes in and plays nothing but special teams for three or four years and you got him for free great job if he develops into more than that pure gravy hinton i think is is really the one that's most likely to stick um when i was watching him at michigan i think it was in the in the georgia game uh if i recall correctly it was the georgia game might have been ohio state and i just i wrote down matt ionitis like that was who it reminded me of. It's Matt mm-hmm. Ioannidis, you know, down eater, you know, guy who can play five tech, four I, three. I don't know if I'd kick him inside in between the guards, but uh, in terms of just a rotational down eater that's solid against the run, um, you know, does his job. Not necessarily somebody I want to isolate one on one in pass protection schemes and, and rely on to be the guy to win as a pass rusher. But if he's just caving in, you know, somebody on like a stunt, yeah, he can do that. Like he can be the guy that sets up the pins for somebody else to knock down. Very, very solid player. Um, really have no idea why he didn't get drafted. I yeah, assume it's some either. sort of injury thing because other than that, there's no reason. No, his... His whole profile, when you looked at his size, his experience, the program he played at, his tape, like it said exactly what you said. Guy you're going to plug in is going to be a rotational, down eating, defensive tackle that will make occasional plays, but is real solid. Gaps, you know, gap in assignment, sound. Guys like that get drafted in the fourth, the fifth, the sixth rounds, but they get drafted and he didn't. So I would assume some sort of injury or something else we didn't know about. But a good job, again, to just grab a bunch of talent when you have limited financial resources and you have plenty of needs. We're going to keep going back to that thin thing throughout the episode. It's really true. There are only about two or three positions on this roster where they could take an injury and be okay, where they have some stacked depth that is you know would come in and play at a replacement level um i'm just gonna say or better i think replacement level is safe (laughs) um other than that they're gonna see pretty pretty solid drop-offs at a lot of positions if they take injuries which is which is troublesome but again that top tier if you just look at the veneer right if you look at the starters you go yeah that's that's a roster that can can rack up a decent number of wins in dable's first year but they gotta 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 stay healthy Looking at team floor and team ceiling for wins, I think that's as good a transition as any because it literally just does come down to health. If they stay healthy, this starting 22, I think, can win nine games. With the the quality upgrade in terms of coaching, especially on the offensive side of the ball, they can win nine games. The NFC is it's not quite what it used to be. Like they, they can rip off a decent little stretch here. I don't know if they're like a, a seventh seed caliber team, but I wouldn't completely rule it out if they take no injuries, because I think that Daniel Jones, as much as 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 much shit as we've talked over the years, he is talented. He's got an arm. For sure. He's mobile. Good kid. Hard worker. And under Brian Dable's tutelage, and especially considering the addition to the offensive line. The pressure rate should be drastically lower than it was early on in his career. The additions in terms of weapons over the last couple of years. If there was ever a time for Daniel Jones to be 
what they thought he was going to be, it's now. He has everything around him to be that guy. And if he is that guy, God willing, the neck injury I know is scary. We still don't really know exactly what's going on with that. But God willing, he's okay. He's developing. Yeah, nine win team. I I truly believe that. Mm -hmm. But if there's a setback with the neck, or if there are other injuries taken on the defense, because again, the secondary is razor thin, linebacking core, other than the top two guys, inexperienced. Offensive line, still kind of thin if one of those tackles goes down. Not entirely sure about how they would handle that. If they start getting hurt, probably four or five wins. I, I, I truly believe that. So I think the range here is wide. But I do think that there's enough things to be excited about for Giants fans that they can be comfortable with just being semi-decent, knowing full well that they have a lot of money next year and they're probably going to have a decent pick in the draft. And a lot of the positions they still need, luckily, next year's draft is full of them. Yeah, and I want to go on record and and put put this out there. I want to see Danny Dimes succeed. Like, he is a really fun prospect that has some extremely high highs. He is very talented. He throws a great deep ball. He can run when he needs to. He has his limitations, but he was also put in a lot of bad situations. It's not all on him. A lot of it is on him, and they've got to get him to hold on to the football when he gets hit because he is going to get hit, and more often than not, when he gets hit really well, the football comes out. And that is just as disastrous, or has been for him at least, as any number of bad decisions or interceptions. So reducing the pressure rate is key, but I want to see him succeed. And Dable is probably, no, not probably, Dable is his best shot at that, best shot he's had, and one of the best, one of the top five guys in the league that you would bring in to say, okay, get anybody you want to fix Danny Dimes. Like Dable's going to be in the top five guys. I want to see him be able to stand in the pocket and unleash because he's a really talented thrower when he does that of the football. Mm-hmm. And it's just more fun. Like seeing your quarterback get folded over and fumble more often than not is not very much fun. Seeing him stand in and hit long completions in small windows is more fun from a football fan perspective. So from just pure fun hog sort of perspective, I want to see him hit his potential. Right And Dable and the addition of the tackles, a couple of more weapons, is the best chance. They have to go with him this year. They don't have another choice. If it doesn't work out for him, I don't know that he gets a longer leash with the new regime. They had to go with him this year. There was no choice with all the money we talked about and everything else. And there's a good chance there's something there that's very workable as an NFL quarterback. So you stick with it, but do you stick with it after what will be year five next? No, 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 no. Especially <laughs> with next year's quarterback class where it's like, yeah. why, why would you, you know? Yeah. So if he stays in, gets protection, takes what Dable's teaching him and, and sort of surrounds himself in all of that and, and hits some of the level that was projected for him when he was drafted, Giants fans will be thrilled. Will they win double-digit games? I doubt it. Uh, But could they win nine pretty easily? I could see it if he gets hurt, if those tackles get hurt especially and we get right back to high pressure rates. I'd say six is the floor. I I just see Dable and his staff being able to crank out sort of grab or snag six wins. Um, probably won't all be pretty and definitely not going to be a threat anywhere near down the stretch with that number of wins. But I think nine's the top. And if they hit that and Danny shows any, well, not any, (laughs) Danny shows some consistent flashes. I think Giants fans will be happy knowing that they know better days are ahead. And that again, the direction has been corrected and the, and the ship is on course. Right now, they're over-under, by the way, for wins is at seven, which is like the classic number of like, we really don't know. And to be honest, I agree. We really don't know. That is literally the middle of my reign, right? (laughs) And you're just like, 
I no, I wouldn't put any money anywhere near that. Not that I've been not that I've been a big Giants better in the past few years, but that is you'd have to bring that down a full game before I'd even sniff it. And I think a lot of it just does come down to 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 Jones's health. I think that's which the, the organization, in fairness, says his neck is good to go. They said it's not going to be a problem. I I absolutely hope that's true. Uh, but that's also not the only inju- injury that he's ever sustained. So no. we just got to hope he stays durable. Got to hope the weapons stay durable because Lord knows they haven't either. And uh, we got to hope the tackles stay on the field too because if one of those tackles... And the down, corners. We, and the corners. and <laughs> Don't forget the corners. Oh, and the linebackers. <laughs> oh, man. And, and probably the it's tight end. It's a long list. <laughs> if, if there's one position I'm excited about with depth and a combination of coaching staff, it's their sort of edge rushers and what they call strong side linebackers that's the only thing they got a lot of is edge rushers they've got three like they've got ojalari they've got ellerson smith they've got o'shane zimenez who i like from a few years back like i think wink's gonna have a lot of fun with those guys and i think giants fans are gonna have a lot of fun watching what he comes up with that's that's the good stuff that's what we're super excited about other than that the the mantra is stay healthy and and Look for a you know a competent NFL coaching staff to to lead some talent and see what they really have. Well, that was remarkably positive compared to what I expected for this episode. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> I hopefully hopefully Giants fans have a, a little glimmer of of hope for 2022 heading into what you and I think is going to be a very exciting 2023. Just got to get through the next 12 months, folks. I promise. It's worth it in the end. Uh, so, but that'll wrap it up for us for today. Tomorrow, we're looking at the Commanders? Correct. Hey, I got one right for once. How about that? Uh, so tomorrow's going to be the Commanders, and then uh, we're going to go through the rest of the NFC East after that. So if you're a Giants fan and you want to know what you're going to be dealing with for the rest of the division this year, make sure to come back for all those episodes. And uh, if you're not a Giants fan, what are you doing here? Genuine question. They still love us. They still love us. Uh, 56 minutes into talking about the Giants. I never thought we'd get there. But uh, thank you all for watching and listening, however you may be consuming. We'll see you all tomorrow. And uh, until then, later. Take care. Take care.